everybody. So today we are going to go through part two of the journey to a more equitable search. So equitable search is defined as gathering your user's natural language to incorporate into your taxonomies, your indexing and tagging practices, as well as your knowledge graphs. This is enabling your users to search with the language they are the most familiar with, the most comfortable with. And that has been shown to increase the satisfaction and equality in the type of search that we are all conducting at our institutions. All right, so today we are going to be going through how you can use bi-directional assessment methods to understand how well your current or future taxonomy aligns with your user's natural language. We're going to go through it together so you can get a feel for how you would use this. Also want to mention that the terminology that we are going to go through in this video, the survey is in the description below. Please consider filling it out so that we can gather more natural language for these machine learning terms so that we can actually put this into practice. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, let's go get started. We are going to do the first section that is going to be focused on the more automated approach of extracting users' natural language. And then we are going to do the ethnographic survey type of extraction at the second part of the video. So regardless of which automated or semi-automated way you go, you do need to start with a source vocabulary dictionary, encyclopedia, or other lexicon type resource. You can also use full text extraction, but this isn't necessarily the natural language. If you use something that is more discourse based, like a Yammer feed, or maybe a group chat, or perhaps something like Twitter, but again, be careful if you're using something like Twitter, that is absolutely more um, linguistic and natural because it is the natural discourse. So that's probably a good one to start with and try out. But again, be careful which source you're using if you go that direction. Other lexicon sources, of course, are controlled vocabularies. And for this exercise, I actually used the Encyclopedia of Machine Learning and Data Science. The second thing that you need is you then have to gather the terminology and definitions that you wanna use. This is something that is more um, project-based. You want to focus on one piece of your taxonomy at a time. When you are gathering the terminology controlled, you wanna make sure that you get something that's going to have some kind of text to it, whether that's a definition, a scope note, something of that nature. In this case, it's an encyclopedia. So if you are going the more ethnographic route, you will want to create a survey. And we are going to be going through that in the second part of this video. And you will also hear the questions I asked, the kind of interpretations. That is more of the interview style of the survey. You don't always have to do that. You can just do a straight up survey. And if you are going the more automated way, you are literally just going to grab the definitions and the terminology that you have from step two, and we are going to put it into a text extraction tool. And in the spirit of this video series, I am not going to be using anything that is code heavy. I am going to be using an AWS tool that you can all go and sign up and use for free to try this out. And it is called comprehend. I'm going to walk through how you use it. It is a pre-trained model. So if you have your own models or your own machine learning group, that is a great place to go and try even more sophisticated means. But for this video, we're going to keep it simple. All right. And just to finish out the last two steps, and that is assess the matches and the overlap between the natural language and the controlled terms and using those results to map in clusters and understand how certain keywords relate to each other. That is video number three. So let's go and grab the first prompt. All right, so we're gonna grab this and we're going to go to comprehend. Okay, so this is Amazon comprehend. Uh, if you want to use it, there is uh, some free testing that you can do. So you just have to sign up for free and go and try it out. So we're gonna launch this. All right, so you wanna make sure you're in the real time analysis area over here. We're going to go down and we're going to use the built-in models. Um, these are neural networks and a lot of other uh, data that Amazon has put together to train its models. So we're going to take this input text that they have a sample and we're going to get rid of it. And we're going to add our own. 
and then we're going to hit analyze. Right now we are on the entities tab. So these are going to be um, more of the key words, not key phrases. So you'll see there is a confidence level next to it. It gives you sort of the data type and it also tells you what the entity is. So you can see these aren't that great. <laughs> And that's okay, it's to be expected. It's a very small amount of text. And to be fair, when you do the free version, you do only have, I think, 500 characters or something that you can use. All right, so you can see that these do have confidence scores. There are a few pages of them. And so you can gather these and do additional testing, either through triangulation, where you test on three different text analytics tools, or you test on the same analytic tool with three different definitions for the same concept. All right, so in this application, you are going to gather these terms and you are going to set them aside for the assessment portion. I'm going to go over the assessment portion after we look at the survey. And the reason for that is you will do the assessment the same way, either doing whether you did the automated extraction or if you're doing the survey approach. So when you get to that first prompt, extract, the keywords, and we're gonna talk about what you would use as your preferred label. Frankly, the, the whole point of equitable taxonomy is whatever you came up with is right. <laughs> and I don't even know what you put in there. So this is not a test. All right, so let's go ahead and start. I'll, I'll kick it off. And so when I was looking at this, I saw, um, I pulled out Boolean. Uh, I, I found things about um, constraints, and rules, a lot of things about rules. Um, so I, I was thinking it was something about rule generation. Yeah, I had a lot of ones with the word rule in it. Mm -hmm. uh, if then rule. Um, I, I put association rules in there because mm -hmm. it was the mm -hmm. opposite. I put, I put ML technique in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, rule body and rule head. I focused on the if then rule and and I sort of care, considered all the different parts of the rule. So, mm -hmm. so the body, the head, the antecedent, the association. So th that's an important one. In part two, that's the prompts for part two are really going to focus on what you were just listing out. So we'll talk about what is the difference between a property and a relationship, mm -hmm. right? Because what you're describing sounds more like these are related topics, whereas I think some of the things that was coming up with sounded more like properties or characteristics of the actual thing. But again, it's going to depend on your use case. Um, if then rule, and then each of the authors got their own search term, because if you're actually ah. research, the uh, known item searching is really mm -hmm. hard to execute in discovery space. Yeah, yeah. But authors help with that. Um, if then Boolean, uh, if then fire, if then rule head. Under it, it seems like if then is like the mm -hmm. core of whatever this mm -hmm. process is. So it has to have if then paired with something else. It's fascinating. When you do this, you will find, and remember I said there are a few different applications of this. Another one you can use this for is if you are grabbing these definitions, either from your own taxonomy or from assets that you already have, if you find something that is heavily populated with whatever the uh, the concept is, it might be a good machine learning training set, right? So that's another piece to this that you could actually find. <laughs> this one is a horrible one to use in training because it doesn't actually say anything about what it really is. So the <laughs> label for this is classification rule. That's the preferred label for this. There's nothing in here that says anything about classification. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So I would say that this one is probably a really poor training set. And it also is probably not a good label because none of us came away with that. All of us were, were seeing if, then, and rules. So, so something of that nature may be a better preferred label because all of us seem to pick up on that. So let's move on to the next one. The rule of thumb is you always want to focus on the essence. What is this essentially talking about? And the other things that you pull out are more likely concepts all on their own. 
So you don't necessarily have to worry about those at this stage. When you start to create see also's and more knowledge graph kind of creations, that's where you really want to focus on those. All right, so with this one, um, I pulled out some things um, like, again, some rules, some predictions. Um, I saw classifier a few times. Um, a lot of things about decisions. So I kind of thought that there was um, maybe statistical decision making because I, I saw a lot of words that were about statistics in this one. A similar probably classifier, statistical scoring, statistical methods. I don't think either of those actually show up. Um, mm -hmm. Classification probability that also yep. doesn't show up. Yep. Um, and then two terms from right at the end, the pool adjacent violators, which mm -hmm. seems to be so oh, that should have method at the, at the end of it. And then the ROCCH method, which mm -hmm. have been written out. either of those could have been abbreviated or written out. What you're hearing is we're all kind of coming up with a lot of the same things. That's a really good indicator that we are all, no matter what kind of backgrounds we have, are using a similar mental model for these. So that's really good. That that means that whatever the um, source vocabulary that these came from, it is addressing that end user model. So what this also means is when you are putting these tags in and you're mapping them as either um, synonyms or if you're looking at it from the perspective of the different properties of something, it's more reliable because more of us are, are aligned on that. So if you added more people up to those 35, you might get a different story. There's there's only the three of us here and we're probably all subtly influencing one another. So the tag for this is classifier calibration. I can see that one a little bit more than the last one. It means that that label is probably a good one to keep. This is a good way to identify those update and review sequences. This one seems to be fine. It probably doesn't need as much um, updating as maybe the last one. Maybe this one is more well-known, more stable. So those are ways that you can build this into your data governance policies as well. All right, so let's move on to the next one. What did you pull out from this one? Well, I I focused on grouping and clustering. It's, mm -hmm. um, it seems to be describing uh, different cl clustering techniques. So so I, I started with that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the characteristics of uh, that you want to end up with, like common and consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that they evolve in their dynamics. Yeah, similar. Uh, I have um, incremental clustering. I have, no, some of mine are like three words, maintaining good clustering, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. dream evolution. I mm, mm -hmm. wasn't too sure mm -hmm. about that. Um, and then just clustering objects. So that that's good. And that actually came up in, in the last workshop as well, is some people we're pulling out individual topics and terms. Some were like more like conjoined, um, like cybersecurity, two words, but it's one concept. While you're starting to pull out some, some mini clusters essentially. And what you can do is based on the other folks that are doing this exercise with you, if people do tend to use more topical tags or if they move towards more like these sub cl uh, clusters, that gives you an insight into how their mental model is working, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing more people are kind of clustering things together, you can then use that to your advantage when you're doing your own modeling. Um, neither is a bad thing. It, it's just more insight and for decision making for you. The preferred label here is clustering from data streams. We were all pretty close. And I would actually say that this one, when we, we were saying that you could use this also as assessment on um, training materials, this is a perfect one for training materials. I mean, it's, it's to the point. It talks about clustering a great deal. It doesn't necessarily mention data streams all the time, but I don't necessarily think that's the main point that you really want to focus on. I think it is that clustering um, that is the main point here. So that that's that's a really good one. So it checked out, right? So we're tr the whole time we're doing this, we're checking. Did the label match the natural language? Yes. Does the material also match those things? Yes, which means this one seems to be pretty healthy. Remember, this is not something that you're going to sit down and talk through each one of these with every survey you do for your entire vocabulary. That is not scalable, but you do wanna make sure that you have some of these more ethnographic pieces 
sprinkled throughout your other um, exercises because do you see all the great conversation we're having about this right now where we're like, oh, this is a mental model. And so if you have people that do modeling, if you have indexers, if you have people that are training machine learning models, this is a conversation to have because you unearth all kinds of things that people were assuming and didn't really know that they were doing, which is important to do. Let's do um, prompt five. I'm, I'm using these descriptors like class member learning, mm -hmm. Oracle complexity, non-deterministic mm -hmm. algorithm, mm -hmm. um, then sort of how, how they're measured. So mind change was some kind of measured number of queries. No, I don't know how those things necessarily relate all the time. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So when I was looking at this one, I, I certainly started to pick up on more of those unique keywords, you mm. know, so like the different types of algorithm. Um, one thing I, I kind of had to read between the lines a little bit because it talked about um, PAC learning, but it didn't say what PAC was. Um, it did talk about inference, which I do love my inferencing. So I kind of understood what that was talking about and then query based learning. But throughout it was almost talking about learning as if it was a human teacher teaching a student, but with computers, which is strange. Um, so I was a little confused on this one, but I, I basically chalked it up to um, computer learning, which doesn't sound mm. like a very good label, but that's kind of what I boil, boiled it down to. The preferred label for this one was computational complexity of learning. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a good example of what not to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so if you had this already in your taxonomy, this would be a good indication that that label is just confusing people and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So using the natural language exercise that we just did, you could perhaps create a better label or you could downgrade this one and uh, use an, that natural label as the preferred and then the computational learning, uh, complexity of learning as um, an alt label, or you could just get rid of this label. I mean, it's. I think we all feel like we have to hold on. Well, it's the preferred, the NASA prefers. <laughs> You're not NASA, so do, why do you care? <laughs> it's like Maria Kondo, right? Yeah. If it doesn't give you joy, give it away. <laughs> so true. Right. So true. All right. So last one. Let's let's move on to the last one. Yeah, my list is kind of short. Um, uh, I didn't know what standard NN was, um, but mm -hmm. I put, put that. I put uh, credit assignment. Um, and then computational stage chains. And on this one, you know, I'm, I'm used to reading about neural nets. So I focused on neural net and I started getting into ah. the jargon and, more uh, with my search words. Okay. Well, and, and there is there is the rub, right? <clears throat> yeah. So I like this one. I, I use this one as an example because it does not say anywhere what NN means anywhere. And that is not a typical acronym. I think most people just write out neural networks. Um, the other thing is, with that being said, throughout, I would 100% would have tagged this as a preferred with neural network. But you know what the preferred label of this is? It's deep learning. Well, and, and, and if I were just doing SEO, for example, and, and it was a piece about machine learning, uh, and I mean, deep learning, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's such a common term in, in the, in the media, mm -hmm. but, um, it doesn't, well, mean, it doesn't mean a lot to people who don't know about it. Right. But, and that's the thing, right? Like that's where doing this kind of exercise would help you determine. I know a lot of people, in fact, one of my slides even has deep learning on it and it means neural network. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people do know neural networks. So perhaps to people that are like in the know, deep learning is the word that we would know and know that it's a synonym. But for, you know, people that are not reading this stuff every single day, neural network might be the better one to use. So this kind of exercise will help you determine that. The other thing is, and we're going to, to focus on this in, in the part two, 
Sometimes you don't have to decide what the preferred label is. That's what a knowledge graph allows you to do because the knowledge graph will allow you to give the preferred label as a unique ID. That way, depending on if you have um, customization, so you know the person, you know what level of experience they are, um, or you know at least what their browsing pattern looks like, you can determine to show them heart attack or myocardial infarction or deep learning or neural network. You can do that swapping on the fly because you are using that kind of framework on the back end. So for the analysis portion, you want to start out with first assessing each prompt and understanding what is a match, what is a partial match, and what is not a match. And you have to decide how strict you are going to be when it comes to a partial or exact match. I was pretty strict as far as exact is a string match or a partial match, which is they got either the first part or the second part or some piece of the natural language will align with the control term. And you're going to count them up. That'll give you your match to no match ratio. If you are doing a shorthand calculation, which is a quick and dirty, does this match? Does this align with user's natural language? That will give you the answer. And here you can see for prompt number one, the matches were much lower than the no match. So we're saying that here true means the, ma the exact matches and the partial matches did not actually occur very often with the user's natural language. It didn't align with the controlled vocabulary term. If you really want to understand the significance of your findings, you can also get into chi-square analysis. So I'm going to put a link in the description below for a step-by-step -step process on how you do those calculations, and you can see it here. Partial match number one, which I was defining that as it matched the first part of the controlled term or a partial match number two, which is it can it matched the second portion of the controlled term. You might ask yourself, why bother figuring those two things out, Ashley? I was looking at that from the perspective of if the user got one half of the controlled term, that's the part of the controlled term that is the most important to them. So to me, I wanted to measure that separately. You can squish partial match one and two together though. It's totally up to you. So once you do the full calculation, you will find what is the P value. Essentially, it's telling you how confident you can be in your assessment. What this all means, we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, which means the null hypothesis is true. And our null hypothesis was user's natural language does not align with the control vocabulary term for this example. And this example was classification rule. And based on what we heard from the interview process, that makes sense. People had a lot of difficulty with that one and not so much difficulty with the rest. So I am not going to do the calculation for the rest of the prompts, but I am going to put the data set in a link down below. So if you wanna go and try this out, so that is the main assessment you are going to be doing in this exercise, is to find out how much of your vocabulary or a vocabulary you are looking at is aligning with your user's natural language, your users, your specific users. So if you are looking at your taxonomy that was built who knows when, this will allow you to understand is your vocabulary, is your knowledge graph equitable or do you have some work to do? And this is a great exercise to get that work done. Part three of this series is going to show you how to put it into action. I hope this has helped you get a quick start into your own journey with equitable search. So with that, thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.